Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin, and I have, again, Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and the OpenMPI Project. Jeff, thanks for some time again. Oh, not a problem. Sounds like we got something interesting to talk about today. Yes, we have um, two people from Kitware who work on VTK, the Visualization Toolkit, um, and I'll let them explain what that is. So let me go ahead and introduce them. Uh, first, we have Will Schroeder, and we have... Beric Gavici, and again, they're both from VTK. So, guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi. So, can you guys um, introduce yourself a little bit and give us a little rundown on Kitware? Sure. This is Will Schroeder talking. Um, I'm one of the five co founders of Kitware. Um, I'm currently president and CEO. Uh, we're a very technical company. Um, so, I actually still write a little bit of code now and then. And uh, as far as VTK and where it came from, is is that the question that we're on right now? Sure, yeah, we'd like to know what that is. Right, so VTK, uh, many years ago, I was actually working on um, in a visualization group at, at GE Corporate Research, and we decided that our current, our tools at that time were obsolete, so we decided to, to do something different, and we wanted to open source what we did. We wrote a textbook, we wrote some... Uh, uh, code to go along with it, and that was in 1993, the beginnings of that. And then around 1998, the community of VTK had grown to the point where we realized we could support the software and make a living doing it, and that's what we did. Okay, so, Will, thanks for that. Um, Barrett, can we get a little bit of your history? Yeah, this is Barrett Kev AGN. Um, I'm the director of scientific computing at Kitware. I've been here, let's see, for nine years. Um, I, my main role at Kitware has been uh, VTK development, and also I'm the I'm the lead of the Paraview team here, so uh, I work mostly on the uh, HPC side of things. Okay, so VTK is, you said that it's open source and that it originally came from GE, uh, and then you set up Kitware to support it. Is VTK Kitware's only product? Uh, let me back up a little. Actually, VTK w it was owned by the three people that wrote it, myself, Ken Martin, and Bill Lorenzen. It was never owned or sponsored by GE. just happened. Okay. We, we were working at GE at the time, and we had permission and clear uh, legal ownership of the software that we wrote on our own time. Um, and then, yeah, we, we got to the point where we wanted to do something outside of the GE Research Center. Um, and as far as Kitware and its products, uh, we started with VTK, but we now have a whole host of open source products, including CMake, which you may have heard of. And many open source tools and non-open source tools use CMake now. For example, KDE has adopted it. Um, we have a system called the Insight Toolkit, which is a medical image processing system. Uh, we have Paraview that Bear mentioned, which is a supercomputing application. And uh, let's see what else is worth mentioning. Uh, we have an image-guided surgery toolkit uh, we call IGSTK. So there's a whole host we've developed over the last 11 years. Okay, so VTK, though, is still the cornerstone offering from Kitware? I would say it's not the cornerstone because we rounded out the company to not only do visualization but uh, medical imaging, uh, computer vision, uh, data hosting and publishing, as well as software process. So if you ask, if you showed people our suite of tools, they would probably recognize CMake before anything else, which is a software process. It's a software build tool. And then they would probably recognize VTK. So we're trying to develop a, uh, a wide uh, palette of tools that we can use to address scientific computing needs. Okay, so we're here to actually talk about VTK. So we got that VTK is what you started with. Um, can you explain in your own words, what is VTK and what is its target? The goal behind VTK basically is to take data of any sort, process it, and then produce something that uh, communicates what the data is about to, a, to an end user. And so when we started off, it was more about scientific visualization. So you would take, you know, a 
simulation data set or an MRI scan or something along those lines, something that you would recognize uh, if you looked at a picture of it. Um, and we've since gone to the point of doing informatics or information visualization where you take more random sort of abstract data like marketing demographics or a, a text document and you try and visualize that. So the whole idea behind visualization is to take data and make it, put it in a form that people can apprehend and perceive rapidly. So is VTK an end user application? VTK is a toolkit. Um, it's basically a lot of little components that do things like ingest data, process data, uh, convert data to a graphics layer, and then render the data, and also provide interaction with it. So there's you know complicated 3D interaction widgets. And also there's querying and analysis modules. But there's a lot of little classes that float around that we put together in our applications like Paraview to uh, make VTK usable by the sort of end user. Okay, so would a regular person stumbling across VTK it would look more like a library, something they would use um, with uh, something else they wrote or someone else's tool than they wouldn't just invoke VTK? Generally not, although we have wrappers, so we wrap into like uh, Python or Tickle. Right. And so you can actually run a little shell, load up VTK, and then start writing little uh, scripts that do various things. Yeah, so if you actually had VTK, there is an executable in there that's called VTK. Um, and that, if you run that, that will bring up an interpreter with which you can type, you can start typing commands. Um, to create a visualization uh, program. Right, but you're right. I mean, basically, it, VTK is embedded in other applications. What language bindings do you have available? So you mentioned, uh, I think, Tickle already, and, and what were the other ones? Uh, Python, Tickle, and Java. Yeah, and, uh, other people have experimented with other bindings. Um, for Ruby, for example, there is, uh, if you search out there, there's a, there are Ruby bindings uh, for VTK. Um, and the, I even heard of people experimenting with Lisp. Okay, so what? Just out of curiosity, what language is VTK itself written in then? C plus plus. Ah, so you is there a C plus plus binding as well? Well, yeah, the, the toolkit at its core is all C plus plus classes, <clears throat> and then we built into VTK. There's this whole wrap we call it a wrapping technology, which basically performs a certain amount of introspection on the C plus plus. Uh, class library and then develops the appropriate uh, uh, wrapping layer into the various targeted languages like Python. Yeah, very gotcha. similar to Swig. Ah, Swig, Swig is your friend, yes. So I would assume, <laughs> this may be a silly question, but I assume that you use CMake to build the whole thing. Of course. <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> it had to be asked, of course. I was, I was going to say CMake was actually originally developed to build ITK, but VTK was the second uh, library that really started using CMake. This was nine years ago or so. Yeah, 1999. So what is the, the target scenario that you're trying to address with VTK? And, and you know, pretend I'm an application developer. Am I writing an, applic you know, an HPC application that's perhaps parallel and running on multiple nodes? Am I using VTK in that application, or is it more commonly used in, say, a, you know, a post-processing scenario where I've run a job, I have my terabytes of data or whatever, and I use VTK to look at the data after the fact? I mean, I guess I'm asking, how do people tend to use this? So the most common use case um, is as a post-processing tool, but um, in in a lot of cases, you can still use it, you know, distribute it uh, on a cluster because um, one of our main focus in the last 10 years or so have been to scale the visualization tools with the simulation tools because uh, people run into a situation where their simulation results got so large that they can no longer uh, visualize them on a single uh, workstation, even though it may have multiple processors. Um, so... We have been building uh, support for distributed computing into VTK. So yes, despite the fact that you may be doing post-processing, you would be you know you would be doing it distributed um, if the data was large enough to require that. And I, and we can if you want we can also talk a little bit more about um, 
we, we do have the ability of embedding BTK into a simulation code as well. Oh, yeah. So actually, I'm interested in that. So I, I'm an MPI guy myself. So I'd be interested in hearing, you know, you said that you have support for distributed computing. What do you, what do you mean by that? Um, it's MPI-based, you know, distributed memory computing. So v VTK uh, can load data. Usually the, the data generated by large simulations is already either part pre-partitioned or written in a way such that the post-processor can load it in a partition way. So you can run VTK. Um, well, of course, I'm now in getting into more kind of the application layer and into the realm of applications like Visit and Paraview. Um, so if you were running one of these applications, you would actually run a server that runs distributed that will be probably connected to a client that the user interacts with. Uh, and the server would load the data in a distributed way and it will be running MPI um, and uh, would do the necessary inter-process communication to generate you know, the images and then deliver those to the client for the user to see. So on that same kind of note, um, I've I've used your Paraview product some, and also we had some guys from a national lab who made a product that relied on VTK um, called Visit. Um, when they are doing the distributed memory, is that all being handled by VTK? Like that's where Paraview gets its ability to visualize data on multiple nodes is is through VTK. So. Um in that, Paraview and Visit have slightly different approaches. Um, in that, Paraview does use VTK to do all the distributed computing, whereas Visit has its own layer to do the distributed computing, and they actually use VTK um, as more of a serial uh, processor. But for, for in the case of Paraview, um, all the server is doing is to essentially run um, a, a VTK application to build um, VTK visualization pipelines. Um, Paraview provides a little bit more functionality in that um, they, Paraview is the one that's providing the client-server communication so that when you interact somehow with the client, we need to really serialize some commands and send them to the server. And that's a really uh, the Paraview layer. But it's, it's, it's really intertwined um, and all of the te technology is really based on VTK. For example, VT, Paraview provides just some extra libraries that are in the same style and then uses the same sort of wrapping technology, for example, to uh, provide the client-server communication. Then, as myself, if I wrote some large distributed memory parallel scientific application, I could take VTK and kind of wedge it in there so that I could basically visualize my application as it ran. That's correct, and that's actually one of the um, active research projects that we're working on currently um, is to be able to do that specifically with some of the common large data, uh, you know, simulation codes that generate large data. Um, the idea there is that um, you don't have to save the full-scale data to disk and then load it up on a separate cluster to visualize it, but to actually do it in the same in the same run and then save out to the disk. Um, smaller data, data sets, for example, geometry, that then you can visualize with either a, a single workstation or a smaller cluster than the one that you run the supercomputer on, I mean the simulation on. The geometry would be something we call extracts, and it might be a streamline or a, a contour surface, something that's much, much smaller than the original data. So... What are some of these applications you've done this with? Is there anything out there that uh, someone working at a lab or at a large HPC site might have ran across before that there's people have used VTK with before? Um, so we're, we are working with uh, several simulation codes. Um, the one of them is essentially a hybrid code uh, developed by by the Army, um, and um, and I, I probably cannot get too much into the specific uh, of the of the, of that code. Um, and another, there's another code that um, we are really cro close to the uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute here. They are probably 20 miles from us, so we're collaborating with them. Um, and they have a CFT computational fluid dynamics code that they are really running on on really large uh, systems. You know, going up to 100,000 cores. 
uh, and we're working with them on integrating uh, VTK uh, with their simulation. Their simulation code is called PASTA. So if you're close to RPI, that means you did escape Schenectady, but uh, it sounds like you're still in New York then. <laughs> I actually do live in Schenectady. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> So let me ask a little uh, a further question here about uh, some of the nuts and bolts of VTK itself. So what kind of operations are available? What what does a, an application programmer do with it? Do you do image transforms or or format transforms or say take this data and turn it into a graph or you know what 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 are the core operations that are available in VTK itself? Okay, so the the core model uh, there's an execution pipeline that runs behind. Um, what VTK does in a typical application. And the execution pipeline is built by combining these so-called uh, filters together. So you might have a filter to read data, a filter to an extract an isosurface, a filter then to, to uh, render it. Um, I'm using loose terminology here, but you get the idea that you're stringing together a bunch of, if you will, algorithms that do various tasks to eventually either write the result to disk or display it on the, on the uh, user screen. So um, what people tend to do with VTK is you have to, first of all, understand there's hundreds and hundreds of filters. Um, you're going to find the right filters to combine to do what you want. And so that, that's part of the uh, use of VTK. The other part is that VTK is, it has, supports a very rich set of data structures, so it supports images. It supports structured grids, supports meshes on structured grids, if you will. It supports more complicated data sets like AMR and, and sort of these hierarchical data sets. So our algorithms are written to handle these various types flowing through the pipeline. Okay, and so if I had to draw a crass distinction, would it would it be that the VTK is kind of the number cruncher side of it, and Paraview is the the visualization, the actual display side of it? Is that I, accurate or no? I, I think what's different. Uh, Bear can weigh in this as well, but I think VTK provides all the pieces to do uh, the work that you're talking about, and Paraview puts everything together into a very friendly GUI, including supporting interaction analysis interrogation um, so, yeah yeah i mean I, i'd say that pair view essentially puts a user interface um so that's one thing that it does and the other thing that pair view provides uh is this client server functionality but everything else is really handled uh by vtk going all the way from reading data to disk i mean from disk to generating uh, images that you, you would display on, on, on the screen. So interacting with the graphics card, that's VTK's job. Loading data and processing it, that's VTK's job. Pairview is mostly the driver, um, you know, so that allows the user uh, to visually create the uh, analysis pipeline uh, and then to see the results afterwards. Okay, and what, what platforms does this support? Uh, VTK pretty much runs on anything. Yeah, it goes, I would say, from PlayStation um, to, um, to essentially all the supercomputers that uh, you can think of. Um, so it, anything that's, in, anything that's in, in between, pretty much. Um, we even, at one point, ported uh, VTK to Windows CE, I believe. We did. I don't know if the port is still alive, but <laughs> we even did that. So do you have an iPhone app in the works, then? Um, no, not currently. I think that iPhone... Um, the way we would hit iPhone, it's probably more a client-server um, scenario where you wouldn't run VTK on the iPhone, but you would probably be fetching images and stuff like that. Um, VTK is not a small library, and I would not want to be the developer to try to cram it into something like iPhone. Right. So well, you say you support all kinds of these uh, different platforms all the way up to large supercomputers and whatnot. Do you have uh, you know, any GPU-specific code since that's kind of the computational uh, uh, fad of the day, I, I suppose, that you, know, you can get really, really nice computational rates for certain kinds of problems? And do you support other specialty architectures? You mentioned the PlayStation. Do you have cell-specific ports or anything like that? Uh, let me answer that by saying VTA has an abstract factory mechanism for instantiating classes. So often we will instantiate a class which has specific code in it for driving a particular device, whether it's a GPU or something else. And we 
we do support that. We also have specific code in VTK for particular GPU-related activities. So, and then the community around VTK has done many of these things you allude to. Yeah, and I mean, as, as, as a group, we tend to be at the core a little bit conservative in the sense that we don't immediately jump on the, on the latest um, research topic or you know the, the, the latest technology. Um, but we have um, we have been exploring the idea of integrating GPU-based processing uh, into VTK. I mean, we of course uh, are using GPUs for doing rendering things like you know from polygonal rendering to volume rendering. Those are things that we have been doing for a long time. But the general purpose GPU computing is probably what you're alluding to. Um, we are being a little bit more cautious, but we are definitely building. Uh, example algorithms and algorithms that we are going to be using uh, into VTK. And as far as the cell goes, um, we did not do the port, but I believe that it was mostly running on the VTK, it was mostly running on the PowerPC chip, which is what controls the cell processors, but not the cell processors themselves. Um, there are some research uh, efforts that are going towards that because um, the number one supercomputer um, right now is the Roadrunner at Los Alamos, um, and that is essentially a bunch of cell processors. Um, and there's definitely effort uh, right now uh, in, into running VTK on, um, on the Roadrunner, mainly to actually use the cells to do the rendering to ray tracing. So actually, with the rendering topic, when I asked VTK to finally render some 3D mesh, say, um, completely, you know, with surfaces and everything. Does it just rely on GL or, you know, um, DirectX? Um, what about on systems where I don't have hardware GL available? Does it use something like Software Mesa? Well, yeah, so the way VTK has been written, we have these abstract uh, object model layers that I mentioned previously, and the rendering system is similar in that you create a scene that consists of a renderer, render window, actors, lights, cameras, None of these is specific to a particular rendering library. When, the sys when you instantiate one of these things, it basically sniffs around under the hood and instantiates the appropriate subclass, which might be OpenGL Actor, OpenGL Lite. Um, and then under the hood, all this stuff flows, uh, depending on the graphics layer. A at one time, we supported multiple graphics subsystems, OpenGL, XGL, and so on and so forth. But right now, we're pretty much settled on OpenGL uh, with the opportunity, if we desire, to support something like DirectX. Uh, we could do it if we wanted to, but we haven't seen the need as of lately. And yeah, getting back to your question about Mesa, we do support that. Yeah, and actually, um, on the software side of things, um, we are also adding support to use uh, ray tracers. Um, so, you know, that will be an alternative to Mesa slash OpenGL. Um, just directly use pure ray, ray tracing for the purpose of uh, rendering. So that will, again, be running, you know, in, in completely in the software and would be just portable to any, any cluster that does not have graphics cards. And this ray tracer will support the distributed memory model? Yes. Awesome. I would love that. Uh, so back at the beginning, you said something earlier about VTK. Um, it has its own file formats. It seems, why does VTK support its own file formats? We, well, actually it has more than one file format. It has a couple. <laughs> so when we wrote the code originally in 93, we started with something extremely simple. Uh, since that time, we've developed some XML uh, file formats. Um, now, we never expect to replace what's out there, but there are certain advantages. For example, we can easily random access and pull out pieces of data through these files. Um, and we also wanted to provide implementations for certain types of data, uh, for example, unstructured grid hierarchies or AMR data that would be more accessible for researchers to read and write. Uh, but we also have, you know, probably close to 100 different readers, writers. 
we're agnostic to file formats, but at the same time, there are certain applications that demand certain performance and capability that at the time we wrote them didn't really exist. So if these file formats are in XML, does that mean they're all ASCII? A, a lot of sites now are using things like NetCDF and HDF5 and other of these binary formats. Um, you said you're agnostic, but are you using something like XDMF or something to make it really easy to pull in these binary formats too? Yeah, um, The to answer the first question is that the it's a hybrid in the sense that um, you can actually append uh, binary data to these XML file, uh, files. So the parser will read up to that point, and the rest could be uh, binary. It could be either raw binary or compressed. Uh, and it's, it's chunked usually so that you can uh, do random access rel relatively easily into these files. Um, the and the other one, the other format that you mentioned, XDMF, is, and, and that's something that uh, we also support. Um, and that, that has a little bit of different um, approach in the sense that that separates the metadata um, into the XML uh, file and then the, the heavy data, as, as they call it, uh, into another file. And they actually, uh, the, the number one format that they support is HDF5. And, you know, of course, we, you know, support other variants of, uh, variances of HDF5 and NetCDF uh, and other, other binary formats. I mean, the file format is, I mean, I could go on complaining about it for, for a long time because for us, uh, post-processing uh, so software developers, it's, it's really difficult because we have to provide support for a lot of different file formats because it's really hard for people to come and agree on a single file format that will w work both, you know, for serial uh, and parallel, parallel applications. So, yeah, we, we spend a fair amount of our time dealing with I.O. issues and um, writing readers and writers that will perform well on different platforms and things like that. So what would you say is, is the value add of, of VTK? You know, what makes, what makes it unique? What makes it great? What makes me as an application developer want to use it? I think uh, there are several things that I could mention. I think, first of all, it's sheer size and capability. Uh, it's open source. Uh, that combination together sort of sets it aside from anything else. I think the design is relatively good. It's simple. People have a simple time picking it up and learning from it. Uh, and so that means people tend to embed it in a lot of applications. We've been talking about HPC, but VTK has a huge presence in the biomedical computing community. Um, also, VTK has a, n a nice combination of features. For example, we have this informatics or information visualization component with the scientific visualization. That's a very rare thing. I'm not really sure any large system has that sort of combination. Um, and then also the interaction with the, with what we call them 3D widgets um, and some of the query operations and so on make it a very potent platform on which to build these interactive 3D applications. Okay, and, and taking that on a, a little bit of a tangent, we've talked a little bit um, about the scalability and whatnot. What, it, it's kind of hard sometimes for open source developers to say, you know, how many people are using my product and how exactly are they using it and so on. But you have uh, solid customers and things like that and, and groups that you work with and applications that you work with. What's the largest data set that you have heard VTK or even Paraview used with, just out of curiosity? So, I think the the largest. This is, I mean, this as you said, this is hard to really find out for us. But I I think that the largest uh, visualization done um, is recently by uh, the visit folks. And you, you know, you guys talked to the visit folks before, but I, I think that this happened before you had that uh, conversation. Um, and they have not published this uh, officially yet, but they had some announcements. Uh, they have run. Um, visit on up to 150,000 cores. Um, and, and I'm not sure about the data size, but they are talking about one trillion cells. They are probably reaching the, uh, the petabyte scale. Cool. Um, so that, that um, you know, I, we r routinely work pe with people that use um, visit and pair of you on hundreds to thousands of cores to do 
you know, to do terabyte size visualization. But the, the visit guys really wanted to push the limits to really see how scalable uh, visualization, especially kind of this, this sort of VTK based pipeline visualization um, is scalable. Um, and they, I, and I think that, as I said, I don't have the results on, on the paper yet, but I think that they have demonstrated that you can really make it quite scalable. And the next step is really for all of us is really tie closely uh, with the simulation codes so that uh, we can run in situ with them and make use of these these architecture, you know, scale with uh, the simulation codes to you know hundreds of thousands of cores. So, what kind of things do you have in the software to make it? Scalable, you know, as an MPI implementer, I'm I'm well familiar with many of the dirty tricks we have to do on the network side, you know, to make things scale and make it just work and so on. But I would imagine you're you're very concerned with you know computational architecture and buses and memory locality and things like that. What what kind of stuff do you guys have to do? So on on the parallel scaling of things, we have a great trick in the sense that we actually don't do a lot of inter-process communication. Because visualization, a lot of the visualization algorithms are sort of embarrassingly parallel. And there is there is maybe a, a, a layer of um, cells that, that you need extra to kind of generate uh, results that are processing, you know, number of process independent. But beyond that, there are a lot of algorithms that will just run fine um, if you just chunk the data and then run, run it um, this completely distributed without doing any communication. The communication really happens at the end uh, when you need to bring this data together because the user is going to see this on, on one window um, and you need to either bring the geometry together and render it on one graphics card or you need to render this in a distributed way and there are various ways of doing this. Uh, and then bring the final result together. The most common way of doing it is that you let essentially each process do its own rendering, and then you do what we call sort last compositing, and that is you compare um, images generated by the, the different processes and go pixel by pixel, and you look at what we call the Z buffer. And essentially, the Z buffer controls tells you how far that particular pixel was from the from the camera, and then you you essentially compare these two images and pick for the opaque case the pixel that's closest to you. But you have to do this, for example, in their case, on up to one hundred and fifty thousand processors, and you you have some binary tree that uh, that you build and you, you you keep doing this comparison, and that's where you really hit, um, you know, scalability issues. You have to make sure that. Um, you, you you use the right MPI calls to transfer the data, and you also build the right uh, communication mechanism and the right tree to do that fast. Um, of course, beyond that, we have to look at the you know serial scalability things that you know up using the cache optimally and things like that. And that's really not that different than any other um, simulation code development that you would be involved in. So could I use VTK and actually hook displays right up to the cluster and instead of having it composite all this into one image, just composite like a subset of it and build like a tile wall just using VTK, not having to use anything like Chromium? Yes. Um, there, is, there is a library that the Sandia folks, Sandia National Labs folks developed called ICT. Um, the library is, itself uh, is in pair view repository, but it's really not dependent on in any way on Perry. So actually Visit, I believe, uses it now too. So you can take IST and combine it with VTK uh, to drive uh, a tile display without um, relying on Chromium. So you would actually be running distributed, and it's, it's a more complicated compositing problem because essentially for each tile, you have to potentially composite the results for all the processes. But IST handled that transparently, and then um, you can then render to a tile display. And uh, people have done this on quite large tile display. You know, it, it, it is routine for people to do this on six by four um, tile displays and get interactive uh, rendering performance. Interactive. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, we're talking about probably 15 frames, or se uh, frames per second to 20 frames per second. 
So on a different idea, you mentioned that you thought VTK, you had this, was relatively simple to use and had this nice class structure and you could, you know, even use it from Tickle. Is VTK something that I may find simple enough to use in like an introductory class on 3D graphics and image manipulation? Uh, yeah, the the answer is yes. Um, I actually have taught as an adjunct at at Rensselaer, and uh, we teach an open source software practice course right now, and we use VTK and some exercises of VTK, and the students generally find it fairly intuitive to use, and uh, you know. Part of it, too, is that the documentation, there's a couple books that go along with it, and there's online documentation and tons of examples. So it's very easy to sort of get into an example, look at how the pipeline is constructed and and gener generates images, and then tweak, play with it, and do various things. So it's very easy to sort of get the basics and get up and running. Yeah, and actually the VTK <clears throat> book is used as textbook in various classes, you know, under undergraduate level computer science classes that teach uh, computer graphics. So it is, you you know, it is likely that you actually, if you were to take such a class, that um, VTK is part of it. Okay. And also, how easy is it to extend VTK? What if I wanted students to write a very simple filter and add it to VTK? Is that pretty easy to do? Or does that yeah. require rebuilding everything? <laughs> Yeah, certainly. I mean, you can you can derive classes easily. Um, if you don't want to compile anything, there's actually in the interpreted layers there's there's uh, sort of uh, classes with uh, that define sort of virtual methods that you can fill in through, say, a Python uh, a, a, a Python uh, function or a tickle function. Uh, so it's very there's multiple directions to extend it, ranging from having to compile code with uh, der by deriving classes to in the script itself uh, or a Python language, uh, writing little functions and binding them into the uh, library. And you can definitely load in uh, shared libraries as plugins and overwrite existing functionality or ex extend functionality. That's also supported. So you've mentioned open source a couple times, going off a little different direction here. Um, what is what is your interaction with the you know the open source community? You've mentioned a couple of different ports and things like that. Are are the main developers at, at Kitware, and you kind of accept patches, or are there other random authors out there? How how do you guys do that? We're an open source company, so most everything we do is open, and we engage and collaborate with our community. Uh, we certainly accept patches from whoever develops good code. Now, depending on the nature of the change, uh, sometimes there's very specialized things. You know, we have to sort of say, well, it doesn't belong in a more general purpose toolkit. But whenever possible, we try and incorporate additions, corrections, uh, changes to the code base if it makes sense. And if the the VTK repository is, is actually, um, if you look at the, the users, um, people that would write access to that repository, it's it's a large group of from variety of institutions. We very closely collaborate with uh, Sandia Labs and the Los Alamos Labs, um, and they, they have write access uh, to the repository, but we also grant write access to essentially anybody that demonstrate that they are good coders, uh, and that will have positive contribution to the repository. So let me ask a question uh, that I, I like to ask of other open source projects because I am Cisco's representative to an open source project, and and it's a it's a difficult thing to manage an open source project when you have a lot of different organizations um, working on a on a common code base. You know, people have similar but different goals and things like that. How do you? manage the beast of, of, of these open source projects that you guys kind of sponsor and host as a company? Well, the answer varies depending on the project. So projects like VTK, where probably uh, the great majority of development occurs at Kitware, uh, it makes it a little bit easier because we can sort of talk amongst ourselves and make sure the right thing happens. Uh, a project like the Inside Toolkit, ITK, is a bit more difficult because the community is more dispersed. And what we do to manage that project is we actually have an open journal that requires submission of, of larger changes. And the submissions also include data and source code, which is then compiled and checked and evaluated prior to acceptance. 
So depending on the project, we either have a fairly lightweight thing, which is more communication amongst the developers here at Kitware, um, to a broader, uh, more formal approach where we actually require people to provide enough background so that we can evaluate a, a pending submission. Um, and we're also, you know, we're not as big as a Linux uh, community, obviously. Uh, we're getting fairly large, and we're starting to look into alternative methods for um, a lightweight management structure to sort of control various subsystems in VTK. And uh, we should be talking and developing something in the next six months or so to address that. A related question to this uh um, it really influences management style, but I'm always curious as to what uh, version control system people use. So what do you guys use and why? Well, okay, so VTK, the coding was started in 1993. We're using CVS. It's not our favorite. Uh, since that time, we've gone to SVN on various projects, and we're starting to also use Git to some extent. Yeah, so VTK is still, VTK and Pairview are still hosted in CVS. And actually, there wow. is a... There is a technical reason um, that we still do that in that I think we need to change our workflow really to move out of uh, what we're doing currently. And the reason is that the Pairview repository actually does include the VTK repository. Um, so when you check out Pairview, you get, out, you get VTK as well, the development ver version of VTK as well. And that's the kind of workflow because the, really the development of VTK and Pairview are really intertwined. And the way that was originally implemented was essentially in a, as a server-side symlink from you know, the Paraview repository into the VTK repository. And there are really no direct equivalents of that in, in other uh, version control systems. There's SVN has this SVN externals, but it's really, it's not the exact same thing and it requires that you change your workflow. And that, that's something that actually in the next six months to a year or so, uh, we're going to have to bite the bullet and really force the community, Pairview community really, to, um, to change their workflow around that. So two questions. Um, first, exactly how large is VTK, either in terms of number of lines or number of uh, functions? I'm, I'm giving a ballpark here. I think it's around one and a half million lines of code. Okay. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there are um, open source web, uh, websites out there that kind of monitor this sort of stuff. Um, you know, we would have to go to one, check one of those. But I think that's the kind of a ballpark for how big VTK is. Okay. It's about 1,200 to 1,400 classes, I believe. Okay. So to test this thing, because you have this pipeline model and, and there could be all these different interactions between different filters, how do you test and verify that all these filters work and interact correctly? Oh, we love this question. Really? We, okay. we, love, <laughs> we, we, we love this question because one of the dings that you often, often get, especially in the early days of open source, was, oh, you know, open source, a bunch of cowboys running around just hacking code. Well, we have to address that because we're dealing with some very serious customers ranging from national labs to folks doing oil and gas exploration. And so that's why as a company at Kitware, we focus so hard on our software process and we develop tools like CMake, which along the way bring CTest and CDash, which are testing client and server. So to make a very long story short, basically what we do when we any project at Kitware, we write the core software and with tests that go along with it. And so we sort of follow a model of test-driven development and agile programming. So as we develop our software, we continuously evaluate tests that have been written as the software is being developed. The test results then are gathered together by the C Dash server and displayed on a on a web page, or we call it a dashboard. And then our, all our developers located around the world can look at the dashboard and they can see the results of testing on, in, in the case of ETK, multiple dozen different clients, uh, platforms ranging from different OSs to different hardware to different, you know, 32 versus 64-bit platforms. Um, and these tests run not only nightly, but we also have uh, continuous builds th during the day so that anytime anyone makes a change to the repository, it, it, it compiles the system, runs some tests, and shows a result. 
And we also have experimental builds so that people can play around with changes promoted to the dashboard without necessarily committing it uh, you know, completely to the repository. So we, we have this very uh, thorough process that causes sort of a feedback loop to, to occur between the developer, the repository, and the testing systems. So if you were to, for example, commit a code that um, breaks the build in less than an hour, you will get an email saying that, hey, you broke the dashboard. What we call those nasty grams, you will get one of those telling you that you did something wrong. Yeah, as a developer of an open source project myself, I can say that those are just vital. We have something similar, although it sounds like not quite as complex as yours uh, in the Open MPI project. But, uh, you know, we, we do it only once a day. Um, instead of every hour, but uh, you know, we'll get those nasty grams in the morning, like ah, George broke the build, you know, <laughs> and things like that. But it's it's critical. You got to have that stuff to you know maintain the quality and have developers all over the world. So you know, yeah, that's great. I, I love to hear it when other people have spent large amounts of time and energy into testing because it's just it's so important. Yeah. So we have projects going ongoing with the folks at Sandia, the Trillinos and uh, Sierra projects. They're large numerical computing systems, toolkits, if you will, and they're adopting our, our testing process. Um, and, and the thing that's cool about it is, like, I develop most of the time on a Windows platform, um, and I can check code in, and it then will be tested against a, a Mac or a Linux box. And even though I don't have access to the hardware on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the dashboard tells me, you did something that screws up this compiler on this piece of hardware that you don't own. And often, I can figure out what went wrong, and I can make a correction on my system, check it back in, and fix it very rapidly. So that's pretty nice, too. Cool. So what are some upcoming features you uh, are coming out in uh, VTK and, and also Paraview and upcoming releases? Uh, I, I would say one of the things that gets me most excited is this ongoing marriage of science, scientific visualization and informatics. I think this is really important to the future of visualization. Um, and then Bear uh, can talk more about the execution model, but we're also addressing execution models that will run on thousands of cores. Um, so, I mean, we, we have a few projects that some of which directly contribute to, to, to the releases and some of which actually are going to be independent projects. But a few things that we are f looking at, um, one is um, essentially running the visualization pipeline um, in a multi-core multi system in a, a multi-threaded way. I mean, VTK already supports um, multi-threaded you know, shared memory parallelism, but this is a kind of a slightly different idea in the sense that um, the idea of distributing different tasks across the visualization pipeline uh, to different uh, processes, to different cores. And that's, that's a research project that's on, on, ongoing with the uh, folks from University of Utah, uh, the ski group there. Um, and another thing that we're focusing on, and these are not necessarily things that will be in the like, next release. Um, another thing that we're focusing on is um, being able to, because on the simulation side, the things are going to petascale, and the visualization systems are not really going to scale um, to, that, to that in terms of buying VIS clusters that actually have graphics cards on them um, that now are going to be 100 to 1,000 times the, the size of what they used to be. It's just not going to happen because just the people that do not assign the, the right budget to do that. Uh, so we are putting a lot of effort to to provide more scalable solutions so that um, you can actually visualize these tremendously large data sets um, using either um, small resources, and that would be um, things like multi-resolution um, analysis so that you can actually loading a subset of the data as you need it, um, all the way to what, what I was referring to originally, the uh, in-situ processing where you're linking essentially uh, VTK together with the simulation code and running it on the same distributed job as the, as the simulation. Another area that warms my heart is the 3D widgets and interaction capabilities in VTK. This whole area of being able to interact with data, which includes not only sort of fancy three-dimensional 
geometric representations of widgets, uh, but also some of the probing and data extraction that you want to do interactively. So that area really turns a visualization system into a visual data interrogation engine, and that's a very interesting place as well. Cool. Now, one thing I think we neglected to ask way back at the beginning is, what license do you guys distribute all this stuff under? BSD. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. This has been good. Um, before we leave, though, can, can we get the VTK website? And if there's like a mailing list and online documentation, where's all that located? Sure. The best place to go is vtk.org. And uh, you'll find all the links to mailing lists and uh, Doxygen documentation and so on there. And if you need commercial support, you go to kitware.com. And that's pretty much it. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, this show will be up uh, soon. So thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate the time. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, guys.